Yeah. Some kids need a friend's reassurance. Some kids need a friend's gentle care. Some kids just need a friend's love. No matter what the children needed, Dan was able to provide it. Her hands healed, her wards healed, her heart healed. The student, staff, and community that she served will be better off for being healed by her. Thank you. Know, Jim, you had worked with Fran for many years. <laughs> Uh, today was one of the toughest days of my career, but um, as tough as it was for us at the middle, my uh, thoughts and prayers go to her family uh, at this time. Uh, Fran was a, a real pillar, <coughs> excuse me, strength for us. Uh, you can count on Fran for anything. She was always such a, a part of the building. Uh, was friendly with everybody and gave you the honest to truth, sometimes a little too honest, but the honest truth. And uh, she was loved by everyone there, and uh, she'll never be replaced. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Anybody else? Mr. Schwartz, also, um, Fran worked at your school. As yeah. Well. Um, you know, echo what Mr. Simpson said. Um, she was very hardworking, uh, caring for the kids, uh, very loving. Um, the staff met, again, tough day as well at the building. Uh, the staff met in the morning. Um, one of the things they decided, uh, they wanted to dedicate a book uh, to all the classrooms and the libraries in her honor. And they chose the book uh, Heart Prints uh, because of love and kindness that she left with our kids. And the book defines Heart Prints as the impression left behind by an act of kindness. Uh, and the teachers read the book today to the kids, uh, especially at the young age with the elementary. Uh, it's a tough uh, conversation to have with, with a group of young children. And, um, but the kids, you know, they talked about uh, the different heart prints that Ms. Strain left behind at the school. And, um, you know, the day started off pretty rough with a lot of tears. And, you know, by the end, there was a lot of nice stories and, and uh, kind acts that was shared, uh, <coughs> she'll surely be missed, and our prayers go out to her family. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. 
Anybody else? I have a few things myself. I knew Fran um, from St. Barbara's. Um, she does some, um, some of the same ministries that my husband and I do. Um, shortly <coughs> after her accident, a Facebook page was set up called Five for Fran. Friends, family, anyone was asked to take five minutes at five o'clock every day and think of Fran and pray for Fran. After Fran passed on Saturday, the page still stayed active, and what the um, people who were maintaining the page wanted people to do was write down thoughts about Fran, some memories, some kind words, what, whatever. So I wanted to share some of them with you right now. I did a few um, that I, I just picked out my favorite, tells that. Um, she was always there to help, always had a smile, and was always just pleasant to be with. Another person wrote, an angel has gotten her wings. Um, another one, Fran was a kind soul that touched many lives. And here's yet one more. She handled the kids with such patience and care, but knew how to see through some of the middle school shenanigans. A great combination. <laughs> you probably appreciate that, right? <laughs> Uh, and finally, my last one, and this is from, uh, like I would, oh, I want to say, the mouth of babes. After our first grade teacher last fall, Marilyn Jojak, died, one of the students said that the kids from Sandy Hook in Newtown must have needed a first grade teacher. Now, after Nurse Fran died, the student, another student came forward and said the kids must have also needed a school nurse. So we will all miss her at Penn Trafford, and we will continue to think of her family, especially in the next few days. Thank you. All right. Um, Brett? Mrs. Issing. Here. Mr. Kachasek. Here. Dr. Koshko. Here. Mr. Leonard. Here. Mr. Newell is absent due to work. Mr. Namick. Here. Mr. Petrucci. Here. Mr. Stovar. Here. Dr. Trey. Here. You have a quorum, Madam President. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, prior to this meeting, a brief executive session was held to discuss personnel matters and for receipt of information. Okay. Um, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of January 13, 2014? So moved. Second. Motion by uh, Mr. Leonard, second by Mr. Dr. Trey. Question. Question being called for. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, no. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Harris, information? Sure, we're going to begin the meeting with um, Lucas Johnson. He is our student union representative from the high school. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Uh, we're going to start off with sports. Uh, spring sports such as baseball, softball, tennis, track, and volleyball are beginning to have sign-ups in the cafeteria. Winter sports are coming to a close as the fall sports begin another few months of conditioning. Um, prom, prom buzz is very clearly seen around the school as the boys try to create ideas on whom and how to ask the girls looking for dresses. <laughs> this heist is only the beginning stages as prom will not be held until May 2nd, but tickets will be sold sometime in April. Uh, the second semester, students are focused on academics more than ever as the school year winds down to zero. The third quarter is usually the grade saver or breaker when it comes to the end of the school year, so everyone is uh, tensing up on the, as the year winds down. Uh, the Warrior Cash Dash is constantly fo uh, focusing on promotions to create financial literacy while at school. This month there is promotions for Valentine's Day. The next promotion is to be seen where we focus on a sports package for students and staff to end this miserable winter and welcome everyone as Mother Nature moves on to spring. The Community Action Program, uh, this month they will begin their annual spring food drive at uh, the elementary school has already kicked this off. Uh, is there any questions or comments? All right. Thank you. Thank Sounds you. like all the fun is being planned. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, student of the Month, this is my favorite and actually the school board's favorite part of the meeting. Um, we're going to begin with Dan Denapoli from Level Green. Dr. Harris. It gives me great pleasure to have Juliana Palasek, a fifth grade student, represent Level Green Elementary as Penn Trafford's Elementary Student of the Month. 
Juliana is the daughter of Jennifer and Chris Palisac, um, which we like to call the village of Level Green, as well as her old, as well as the older sister of Brady, who's sitting in the back there. He's in third grade at Level Green. Not only being a model student, Juliana is well-rounded and very active. She enjoys playing soccer. So she enjoys playing club soccer in the Allegheny Forest Football Club. And practices tap, jazz, and ballet at Janet School of Dance. Juliana recently took part in the PT Sky Talent a few weeks ago and did a fantastic job. She also took part in the Level Green Talent Show last Friday. Thank you. Juliana enjoys a lot of other things, but she says, honestly, soccer and dance take up most of her week. So she's pretty full. Juliana's current teacher, Mr. Joe Benini, who is here as well, states that Juliana is the type of student that actually listens to every word I say, literally. And that is saying a lot, having to hear me talk. Her eyes are glued to whomever is speaking, no matter what may be going on around her. In addition to being an outstanding student, Juliana is very unselfish. She is willing to help anyone at any time, whether it's her best friend or someone she already knows. Continues to say, I guess you could say that Juliana is one of the most unselfish people that I've had the pleasure to meet. Others in the school state Juliana is highly motivated and a leader amongst her peers. She represents, represents Level Green well, and we are proud to have her in our school. I got a chance to talk to her brother a little bit today, one on one. Uh, Call him down to the office of the loudspeaker. Two more says. Um, Brady says there are times when they argue, but at the end, it's all good. Brady enjoys playing Xbox and, Xbox and spending time many days in the summer swimming in the grandparents' <coughs> pool with his sister. Lately, with all the snow they've been having, they've been getting into some good snow bath, snowball battles. Brady states that Juliana is a great person and loves having her as his <coughs> sister. He also stated that you help him clean his bedroom sometimes. He was just making that up in mind. But on behalf of the Penn Traffic School District and Love Green Elementary, we would like to congratulate Juliana on being the elementary student. Roger Sullivan. Thank you, Dr. It's an honor for me and for Trafford Middle School to recognize Sydney Smith as Trafford's Student of the Month. Sydney is an eighth grader at Trafford Middle School, and today with her is her mother and father. Sydney is a straight A student and has been all year. In fact, nothing lower than a 95 percent. She's taking advanced classes such as advanced literature and geometry, math being her favorite subject. You know, I met with her in my office and uh, I said uh, to her, you know, you've had nothing but an A all year long. She quickly corrected me and said, Mr. Sullivan, I've never had anything lower than an A. <laughs> <laughs> she is a Spectrum student and has participated in the great debate, junior achievement, and the photography competitions. She shows off our Penn Trafford school spirit as a middle school cheerleader and was captain of the squad this year. She is a homeroom representative for her student union and is one of the students who produces and delivers the daily morning announcements on TV at the middle school. Sydney is an accomplished swimmer for the Greensburg YMCA and the Haymaker Swim Club, swimming the butterfly and freestyle events and she plans to swim for the high school. Let's see Mr. Babbitt over there. <laughs> she is a member of the Community United Methodist Church, where she also volunteers, generally working with children. Sydney says she plans to pursue something in the medical field, clinical, because she likes to work with people. Here's what some of our teachers say about her. She's determined, motivated, and thoughtful. Sydney is, was a slam dunk selection. She is courteous, extremely respectful, humble, and someone that just has success written all over her. 
She's a great role model for Trafford Middle School. In my class, <clears throat> I don't view Cindy as another student. She's an extension of the teacher, often, often looking to help others and making sure everyone is included at all times. Cindy is without a doubt a first class student. Cindy is a conscientious student. Her inquisitive nature causes her to look deeper into material and she looks for real world connections. She is also extremely pleasant and helpful to students around her. Her fellow students think that she is kind, friendly, smart, athletic, pretty, and has many friends. And she's a definite leader. Cindy, we're very proud of you and congratulations. Kids standing all like it's real scary. <laughs> Probably so nervous and scared to death. I don't blame you, but it's, it will only be two minutes, Laurel. Maybe more. Um, Laurel is a senior at the high school, as I said. Uh, I see she's here with her mom. Hi, mom. Congratulations. You've done well with her. She also has a brother, Alex, who's in eighth grade at Trafford Middle School. Uh, Laurel is, is number one in her class. She has a 4.6 grade point average, and it seems like every year that GPA climbs and climbs and climbs. It's the highest we've ever had at the, at the high school with all the weighted courses. And believe me, she's taken every one possible, and it's been a little bit of a chore trying to get her schedule to, to work, but she's managed it by juggling things around and taking things over the summer and manipulating things, and she's done very well with it. She's also in the band and color guard in ninth and 10th grade. She's a part of NHS. Uh, and I, I, Came to my attention that a year or two she decided she wanted to play violin and she just decided I'm going to give this a try. And she was, this is just a year or two ago and she started taking violin lessons and I understand she's a very uh, accomplished violinist right now so that's uh, quite an accomplishment for somebody to do uh, this late in life so great job Laurel. Um, she also volunteers at the local library, the VA, Special Olympics and at a retirement community in, in Turtle Creek. Something else she's involved in, which takes a, a tremendous amount of time, is the mock trial uh, that we have here at the high school. We have a team of kids who work hours and hours after school and, and, and work on different cases, or a particular case that they practice for and, and compete. They, they beat South Moreland uh, last, uh, last month, and they're going to compete against Greensburg-Salem here on Wednesday, February 12th at 5 p.m., so if you're available, every, anybody's welcome. They're going to go against Greensburg-Salem at courtroom and courtroom number five at the West Moreland County courthouse so we wish them luck but uh, as a part of that team she's the the lead lawyer there she's she's shined as, as a leader with that group because she has the most experience the, the kids look up to her for advice uh, she spends countless hours looking over the court documents and evidence and, and pages and pages of, of information to uh, you know, go through it and, and pull out the important pieces and, and uh, share with the younger kids and what they need to do so she does a great job with that and uh, we wish you luck uh, next uh, next week on that um, we also have uh, the academic quiz team, which she's a part of, and uh, she's been a leader in that the last four years. She has been uh, actually, she's actually the top scorer right now in, West Moreland, in the West Moreland County League of all the schools, so uh, she does very well. She's been named the, M the team MVP this year and captain, and um, you know, she's the one they look to to make decisions and strat strategies on how to, how to attack the, uh, the team and what the best strategies are to, to win the competition. And as a spinoff of the quiz team, she's also been a part of the Hometown High Q. You may have seen that on, on television. That's on every Saturday uh, on Channel 2. And uh, they, I remember watching, I think it was in December, they, they competed against Upper St. Clair and Hampton High School, and, and Laurel and her, and her team won. They, they, they really did a great job in, in uh, being two very, very... Uh, talented schools up in St. Clair and Hampton. So they advance to the next round, and I believe that their competition is uh, is next uh, next month. I'm not sure when that'll be aired on TV, but it comes a few weeks later typically. But we wish you luck there. Uh, Laurel's also involved in the Creative Roundtable, which is a, another organization that takes a lot of dedication and, and some of her leadership skills. She's been a member <coughs> since we began here a few years ago. Um, creative uh, Writing Roundtable is, is a student-led group where they take 
pieces of, of, of writing and they, they critique them and give feedback and submit them for, for publication and recognition. And this year, uh, Laurel has won the Silver Key in Flash Fiction and Mark One, and she also won an honorable mention in uh, Writing Portfolio. So she's done very well with this. Um, when I talked with Laurel today, she's commented that she's, with the breadth of education that she's received here at Penn Travers, she, she feels very, very prepared uh, for her life afterwards and the rigors of college. Uh, she plans on majoring in geology, which is, which is a different uh, major. Uh, don't have too many going to uh, geology, but she wants to specialize. She's thinking in volcanology or hydrology, so very interesting. Uh, her top college choices right now are Columbia University, Rice University, and the University of Chicago. Uh, she's waiting acceptance, hopefully, uh, right as of today, she says she'd like to go to Columbia, but she says every day it seems to change, depending on the weather. So, But anyways, uh, Laurel, congratulations. It's an honor and privilege to have you as a student. Thank you. Congratulations, Laurel. And I saw you on TV. We did watch it. We were proud of Penn Trafford. You know, my brother lives in Upper St. Clair, so we were really proud of Penn Trafford. And I'm sure you'll have a great career. No matter what college you choose, you seem to have a lot going for you, and you're a hard worker. So not to you. And students, we're going to take a brief moment to have your picture taken by the press. So there were three students in the month. Please come over to the side of the room. basically with our architect's uh, recommendation that if, when we go out for bid in April, we may have up to a 10% of the project, um, the bids might come lower. We might have up to 3.2 million to spend. We do not know for sure. It could be less, it could actually be more, but we wanted to have a plan in place. So April, the bids are open, we have extra money, we don't want to waste two or three more months deciding on what to do. So during the last meeting, we sort of got down to six ideas, and we refined, um, we redefined some of our options. So we kind of just want to have a chance tonight to discuss some of those options. So I'm basically going to talk about each category, and if you have questions on it at this time, board, or if you want to have anything to say or input, that is fine. Hank is available. I can't see. Okay, he's over there. So it's Dan, our construction man, management team from Missouri. Um, it looks like. Basically, our high school annex was recommended as a top priority. Um, does anybody have any questions or concerns about the high school? Um, second was the um, 
Canadian restaurant. And remember, we had to actually change the price of that last meeting because um, we had to take them back. We had to repair the price of the ranch and damage and some extra instruction to go along with the restaurant at the Rupert Stadium. I, I actually have some. Um, and I actually talked to Rich a little bit. So I do want some clarification now. I believe we had to make some adjustments because of some ADA requirements as far as having a parking spot there. Um, am, I, am I correct on that? What is, can you explain what those ADA requirements are? Why, why do we need a parking spot just because we have a parking spot? Well, um, whenever you're building a new structure, it, it, and it's a public building, a public structure, it has to meet the requirements for Americans with Disabilities. It's got it's to be an accessible structure, meaning somebody with a disability has to be able to enter that building. And that, so it has to be on what they call an accessible route. And an accessible route is an area that, that, that somebody with a disability can get from their car to the building. The problem with where this building would be located at the top of your existing bleacher area, it's down kind of half over a hill, and the, the existing paved walkway is steeper than what's allowed by the codes for an accessible ramp. So the, the, the most cost-effective way to make it accessible is to allow, is, is to make an accessible parking space down there so that you can drive to that space and then make an accessible route from your parking space into that building. But they need, someone needs to be able to drive up to the restaurants. Somebody needs to be able to get to the restrooms. And the most cost-effective way that, that we can come up with for making that happen with the location of your building is to allow them to drive to that location and okay. park. Because the, the ramp would be extraordinarily long from, from your upper parking lot because of the, the change in elevation so, from. So how do we envision a road, an access road, going to the restrooms? It would, it, it basically would be the, the, take the same route that the existing walkway takes. We would, we would widen that walkway and we would reinforce that walkway to be able to support vehicular traffic. Okay. All right, thank you. Any There's a range. It's it's looking like it's about 45. It may be as many as 50, maybe as few as 43. I've got to <coughs> finalize the drawings, but it's it's in that 45 range. <coughs> and what was the estimated cost of doing that? Twenty thousand dollars. It was like twenty thousand dollars that we were going to roll right into the base bid. It was not going to be an alternate. It was going to become part of the. What it, yeah, what it's doing is it, it's widening that road from 24 feet to 30 feet wide to allow diagonal head-in parking for events. And 
park at the high school as if anyone who has attended any one of our main events can vouch that parking is definitely an issue. And as well as, I know we've been talking about lighting for the park and we need her tonight. Please note the, or the lack of lighting. <laughs> and you can definitely guarantee that lighting is I'm sure we need it. Um, last week we also talked about the access road. We actually took the access road, road and it was an add-on option. And we took it and added it to the base bid. How is the access road that we're adding back to the base bid? I know originally we had concerns from the community that the first access road we was how is it different than the first access road well, we described? In the original design, it wasn't really an access road as much as it would it was another full functioning daily use road for for buses cars public for, for everybody to use it was it was a true second way in, in and out of the campus on a daily use it was it was a paved two-lane road and what was decided was to not pursue that route but then the the safety committee had concerns about there still only being one way on and off of this campus then in the, in the case of an actual emergency. So the idea was then to install a gravel emergency vehicular access road only that would be gated at both ends, both the up here by the building and down at the, at the far end of the school's property. So it would be gated off and not used for anything other than the unforeseen emergency. Yeah, Matt, Matt just was a second. Uh, when we were earlier, somebody used the term crisis road or something like crisis, crisis, crisis response. response response road. So I just want to make sure that this isn't a this is something that's existed. But with some of the things that have happened more recently, uh, the police department I think comes up and or you get audited by Westmoreland, and it's one of the things. Correct me. Give we me the do names an of the audit. We started doing an audit by the Westmoreland department safety they had their audit recommendation we had the gentleman come out he actually went through every single one of our buildings a lot of our findings we were able to correct we we had videotape cameras we had secured entrance with the door buzzers we had issues with um, how many times we have to practice emergency drills we had a lot of different things we could do in-house a lot of our items that we did not fix or address we kept saying we're gonna wait till the renovation project and we're finally at the renovation project. One of them being the access road, because right now we only have one um, road going to the high school, the main, um, the main drive. The second thing we have to address is the secured, um, the holding area. Some people call it like a holding cell when you go into the school, because right now, once you come into the building, there is nothing stopping you from going from the front entrance the whole way down to the school. And we actually want a secured entrance where we can actually stop take care of all the business the parents or students or whoever's coming in has to do and before right. they we, we call that either a captured vestibule or a secured vestibule all it, it's creating another set of, of of doors with with a locking system so that the public comes into a vestibule and then is allowed into the building from that vestibule not so through the first door thanks Tim. with a lot of our items we couldn't actually do we kind of wait until now is actually time for and we do and we come to our meetings in the past Chief Auto's here, um, we increase Chief Dizzo from Trafford, we have all our um, Rescue 6, Fire Department, we actually have people from the municipal building, the township, the road crew, we talk about different things for our safety, we do two times a year, we address items that still need to be done, and there's items that have to be done, and during this renovation, we want to finish off the different product, um, projects, um, one was being the access road. I know it, is, it has caused some confusion because the first um, time we were going to do it, we were going to use it daily. I know we had, was it that we have all the buses go out to the left? And if you weren't going to the left, you were going to take the main road? Right, we were trying to, for, for um, exiting at the end of the day, we were trying to separate, it was one of the ways we were separating vehicular traffic from, from bus traffic. And we were making, the buses were going out one way and the and the cars were going out the other way and then we then we looked at possibly everybody that would be going left on on uh, 130 would, would 
exit through Warrior Court and everybody was going right, we'd exit through the existing. So now how do you have to decide now what traffic patterns are you using? The, we, we adjusted the traffic pattern, so now we created that, that bus loop, and the bus loop is how we're separating the, the parent or vehicular student and, and uh, parent traffic from the bus traffic. The buses will line up and use that loop and, and go out, and the, the cars will, will, the parent pickup will be around that, that entrance that we have out kind of by the gymnasium where we're doing that loop to, to separate the cars from from the buses still, and then we will have move the student parking to that, that parking lot in the front, and they will be released after the buses are released, so we won't have that intermixing of, of cars and buses. The free-for-all that happens now is your, as, at dismissal time. Now, as far as the access road, so it will not be used for daily traffic? No, no, it's, it's just a gravel road. It, it would not, it, it couldn't be used for daily traffic if you wanted to. It's, it, it's what not a special then? not even special events. The idea, the, my understanding of what that, that gravel road was meant to be was, was from that, that, that security committee or, or safety committee, and it was truly a emergency response type emergency access road to allow for a second way on and off of this campus in the case of an emergency. Front of me, but I believe the consent <coughs> mayor's number is around 43,000. Yeah, it's in the mid 40s. 46. Yeah, I, I have 40,000, 45,000. Um, no, I wasn't sure that was accurate. Uh, now, there's been a complete exploration of the other options and other opportunities to take uh, a similar, albeit longer, road out to 993. In other words, we've explored that, and that is not anywhere in the same ballpark as far as cost. That right. There, there's only, there, there, your options are very limited considering your, the geography of this campus. There is a, uh, there's a, there's a paper alley off of, off of 993, which means there, there's, there's access between two properties over there somewhere. But the problem is it is down such a, such a steep hillside that even if you took the entire football practice field and graded it out to allow for an access road down. My, in, my civil engineer is still saying that it's, it's, it's too steep to make really work. You'd, you'd have to switch back and there's just not enough room without encroaching on houses and, and eminent domaining houses to make that work. And then the only other option is property that you don't currently own. The, the, the farm behind you, if, if, if that were your property, you could make a long road that would go out through the farm and, and come out onto 993, but it's not your property. Okay, I, I have an additional concern. <clears throat> I reviewed the situation myself, and there's a pretty defined um, 
it looks like a stormwater division, diversion ditch at the base. I'm fairly certain that's what it is. Uh, as if this does move forward to install that road, we certainly want to pay a good amount of attention to that to make sure we don't divert stormwater in a way that it shouldn't go. So that would have to be that may be an added cost. <clears throat> and um, I want to make sure that if this does move forward, there's a, a written policy, part of our policy manual that, ha that does take us, as Mr. Chastity said, uh, future board or current board, an act of the board to change that policy so it is indeed a uh, emergency only type of use and the gates on both ends would be controlled access to the locking and unlocking those gates. But I do absolutely want to make sure this is not an add, add option now. This is part of the main project. That's why we need to make sure we're on the same page here because I was laboring on a misconception. I had, I personally have to say I had the two access roads confused. The add option for the access road for the van accessibility for the handicap accessibility for the um, warrior restrooms. I, I, I didn't, I guess because I was out of the loop a little bit for, for a while there at the holidays, I didn't focus directly on the fact that this is part of the main project. So if this board chooses to move forward with this being part of the main project, I definitely want to make sure we don't overlook the stormwater issue, make sure it's, it has a written policy, and make sure that, that we have a, um, the gates secured, secured at both ends so it can't get overused or anything of that sort because in, in my prior conversations and, and my thought process we looked at the um that's an alternate way to get out because out warrior court and warrior court ends up on route 130 not far from our main entrance so it doesn't give us a lot of relief in that respect and the expenditures that we're looking at i hope we evaluate that closely enough because we may be into a little more of expenditure than 45,000 if we have to do some storm water uh, changes there to accommodate the current storm flows because we can't directly channel that on the water shore. Correct. We've we've um we've addressed the the design and we know that that we have to we have to control the we have to take care of our own water basically and and it all has to go through not only the local review but it's got to go through Westmoreland County and and their their reviews. So that that's all that's all in place. The the second part about the the board. Um, <coughs> portion is not, not part of the design but correct <clears throat> the, the board would have to uh, orchestrate somehow getting that draft that, that type of policy draft at some point in time but i just want to make sure that, that doesn't go unnoticed because part of the um one design uh, parameters we had for stormwater was to locate a stormwater uh, detention and detention facility closely adjacent to where where this um road would go and now that seems to be not a, not a necessity now because of the previous surface of the of potential parking lots. So that that access road could have been a necessity for another reason, not just an exit or ingress or egress, but for access to storm break on because you have to provide access road to right. It's my understanding now that uh, I guess the proper people here to answer is the necessity for that storm pond is gone. Well, it should be should be gone we, we, right now the the direction we are heading is not needing that pond but if if it were to be needed that is the location for it as the calculations on the project moves further on we'll know for sure but right now it, it is appearing that the a additional detention pond in that area is not going to be required and the cost numbers that are associated with design and construction points to a parking lot do you include a cost for pervious surface parking lots yeah it, it's um the, the costs currently include underground detention tanks in those parking lots. And the difference in cost between putting the underground detention tanks in or the additional gravel and the pervious material, it, and my civil engineer has done his analysis and it should either be a wash or a minor savings. But the construction manager hasn't finished their analysis of it yet. Because ultimately, even with underground storage tanks, at some point in time during high peak flows, they, do, they also discharge. Yes. Somewhat. And the, the property design for the service parking lot may not have to discharge. It depends on, of course, it could. It could over, over close. Right, but it's a different kind of discharge. It, usually at that point, it's not a point discharge. Right. right. Okay, thank you. Yep. Did another board member have a, a statement on the policy? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, this is more or less addressed to the, uh, the folks, the fine folks on Warrior Court. I have to go back and say that uh, when I came out as acting as the president a number of months back, uh, we had in a 
consensus in an executive session indicated that as far as the access road, having any type of regular use, it was not even going to be an item up for discussion. We've not waived away from that view or concept in any way, shape, or form. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, in the last couple of months, uh, I'm not aware of the need coming from our safety committee and the potentiality of how it's leaked to crisis response teams. Now, I don't know if many of you know about crisis response teams. I dealt with them in the military, but they're much more effective, much more time sensitive than they have been in, in recent years. And uh, again, apparently coming out of the committee, the action now today, for example, we have someone coming to assault the building. We're not gonna screw around for any period of time at all. We're gonna muster as many people from many, many angles as possible to save kids if we're under assault in any way, shape, or form by a terrorist, by some maniac from our society, from uh, whatever it may be. Let's say the building is on fire. We want immediate access for every vehicle and every person possible to save lives, save lives, save the kids' lives. This is a philosophy that's changed dramatically over the last couple of years, and we're embracing it. We're embracing that in the district. So in the last couple of months, the concept of even having the road there, something that we can get to to get our people there faster in case of an extreme disaster is a necessity. So from my perspective, if you call me a liar or not, I have to look at the concept of having something there, if recommended by the, by the safety committee, that we can access there only, not for construction, trucks coming by, for convenience, not for special events and so on down the line, to ever open that gate. But if we've got to get in that way to get to our kids because we have emergency vehicles and SWAT teams and anything else in some type of a disaster, if it's a critical necessity and it's rec recommended from our safety committee, then we should do it. I have to sit back and think to my own experiences, and I will support that. And I will go against what the basic concept of even having a road, road or a partial road identified there. Like back to my experience as a principal at Sunrise when we're going through the uh, terrorist assaults in New York. You know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, they're going to be coming through our building. We're all thinking what's going to happen to these kids. And I'm walking around the building myself with a, with a club that I used to walk with when I was in the Marines in the Philippines. And off it goes to Vietnam. What kind of protection would that be? We've come a long way to evolve from that. We want sophisticated plans. We want rapid response. So consequently, it's a long way to explain the fact that, please forgive me, those of you at Warrior Court, that I would support that's that gated area there available in a very simplified, simplified sense only for the uh, need of uh, crisis response or relates to natural disasters and other types of scenarios. Nothing less than that. That's all I have. Um, one more comment. Hank and Dan, I would also need a guarantee. I think it's also it's going to be too tempting, the gravel road there, to say, well, that's a quick way for the, a construction vehicle to go to get here. Who's going to notice? I want to guarantee that there will be no construction vehicles whatsoever. We'll build it last. Huh? We'll build it last. Yeah, and, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll um, address it in the construction documents too, in the specifications of the drawings, telling them that it's not a, a construction access and, and put some type of <coughs> penalty to it. Okay. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> as far as all over preventive maintenance. As far as district maintenance, um, we've almost completed complete uh, preventative maintenance throughout the districts on all um, boilers, air handlers, unit events. Um, the only thing we have to finish in, in the schools is the uh, fan coils, which we found out through the uh, throughout the process. We are we are missing several uh, fan coils and motors in some of those, so. We're going to be uh, getting those up and running as soon as, as our budget uh, permits. Um, we have several roof issues in the district. Right now, we have several inches of ice built up on the roof, but we currently have 
roof leaks that we're working on in Penn Middle, Sunrise, and Harrison Park. Um, as soon as we can get rid of that ice on the roof, we've done some spot patching, but we've been pretty un unsuccessful with the, the amount of ice that's on the roof. Um, as far as um, we do have an issue in Trafford with the main sewer line. Um, we have old, the, the old main uh, is made out of terracotta pipe and it's all full of roots. Um, the line will need to be replaced this summer. We had Mike Seesop from the Sewage Authority. Uh, Mike has been a, a great guy for the district. I've called on him twice uh, to do repairs. He's been there immediately and he's worked diligently with our crew to, um, to help us out with issues. He also worked with us over the summer uh, in Sunrise for a sewer smell issue that we had. Um, salt is, has been an issue. We made a decision um, about a month ago to purchase additional salt. Um, our salt inventories with that additional salt are holding. Uh, we also run two trucks with township salt. And um, Tommy Lamoz and his crew has really helped out the district as well. Um, they're great to work with, and they've been, uh, we've been utili utilizing district salt on our lots. Um, that's all I really have. Any questions? I, I got one for you, Kevin. Um, do you have, can you give some kind of estimate now that you've been here a year, year and a half? How much have you, are you doing in-house with some of your newer team members compared to what was done whenever you took the position over? Well, we still use Honeywell, the high school, as far as the control system. Uh, we still use Johnson controls, and we will continue to use those until we decide that we're going to switch to a, to a new control system throughout the district. But pretty much everything else has been done in-house. Um, we, unless uh, we, we do use combustion service for for combustion analysis on our boilers, but um, if we had the equipment, we could do that in house as well. But um, everything else we've done in house. Finally, um, Mr. Inglis. Yes, Dr. Harris. I just wanted to mention. Uh, to everyone that we are having a drug awareness program at the high school on March 4th at 7 p.m. and that's open to anybody and everybody, students, parents, anybody from the community, anybody outside the community for that matter. Um, like I said, it's at the high school auditorium on March 7th at 7 p.m. It's a little different format. We ran one of these before, but um, we're going to have uh, Ken uh, Baca, who's our uh, Westmoreland County coroner and Tony Marcacci, the county detective there, who have done it in the past, but we're also going to have some recovering addicts there to uh, talk about some of their experiences <coughs> and stories to uh, hopefully raise awareness of, of the, the growing problem that is out there with the uh, epidemic of drugs, particularly heroin. So um, please spread the word, encourage anybody to come to that program March 4th, 7 p.m. at the high school. Thank you. Thank you. That is all I have, Mrs. Thank you, Dr. Harris. It is now time for audience recognition. The following rules are in effect. You must state your name, address, and group affiliation, if any. Your statement will be limited to five minutes in duration. All statements shall be directed to the president, and no participant may address or question a board member individually. I may interrupt your statement if your statement is too lengthy, personally direct, abusive, obscene, or irrelevant. I have a list of uh, residents who wish to address the board. Your name will be called in the order in which you sign up. Okay, first of all, Chris Lonzo. There she is. <coughs> uh, good evening. My name is Chris Lonzo. I live at Carlisle Drive here in Penn Township. Uh, my husband and I are lifelong residents of Penn Township and we're both graduates of Penn Trafford High School. I have two children, one a 2012 graduate of PT, as well as an eighth grader currently at Penn Middle. Both of my children have been members of PTAC during the past 14 years. I have been a board member of PTAC for 13 years, and I have served as the president of that board for much of the time. I'm here this evening to thank the Penn Trafford School Board for their hard work and dedication to this school district and the community of PT. PT is not just a district, but a family community that I am proud to be a part of and grateful that I've had the opportunity to raise my children in the same environment that I myself grew up in. 
Yes, can I interrupt just a second? Mm -hmm. I just want to clarify to everybody, PTAC is Penn Trafford Aquifer. Yes. I abbreviated that for time purposes. I know, but they were asking. <laughs> I have an end in sight, just so you all know. Okay, well, there were some people were asking, so I figured we'd get that out of the way. Go ahead, Chris. I stand before all of you this evening to speak out on behalf of PTAC and not just the swimmers that are a part of its team today, but those who were a part of its past and those that will hopefully be its future. PTAC is a parent-run organization that has been a part of this community since the 1970s. Our roster today includes more than 100 swimmers who participate with the team year-round. Our organization is part of the Chestnut Ridge Swim League and we participate in meets throughout the surrounding area with nine close neighboring districts. We're proud that our team consistently ranks in the top three each year when we participate in the league's championship meets, and our team is recognized as a leader within our league, not only because of the level of talent achieved by our swimmers, but also because of the knowledge, organization, and dedication of our parent volunteers. Our coaches have strong swimming backgrounds and are excellent role models. Of the eight coaches we currently have working, six have come through the PTAC program, as well as the high school swim team. Some of our swimmers have qualified to compete at the junior national level and one is currently attempting to fulfill his dream of competing at Olympic trials. PTAC hosts eight to 10 swim meets each year which are attended by hundreds of families from the neighboring districts and teams. All of these families recognize the inadequacy of our swimming pool facility. Officials and volunteers working on the pool deck during meets are apprehensive about being knocked into the pool due to insufficient deck space and are not always able to thoroughly officiate the meets because the deck is overcrowded with swimmers, volunteers, and pool equipment. This presents a true safety hazard to anyone in attendance at the meets. In March of 2013, we hosted the annual Chestnut Ridge Winter Championship Meet. The meet had over 600 swimmers in attendance along with all of their family members. We achieved numer received numerous compliments about how efficiently and well organized the meet was run, not only on the pool deck, but also in other aspects of the meet, such as the areas where families camped out for the day and the concession areas. At the conclusion of a meet, an official who worked within the league for over 10 years approached the meet director and indicated that in all his years of officiating, that one had been the best run meet he ever attended and the only thing that could have made it better was a better facility. That comment has resonated within PTAC and also with myself. As the president of PTAC, I feel it is my duty and obligation to stress to all of you that renovations to the high school pool area need to be a priority, regardless of whether construction bids come under budget. As we continue to grow, our facility is not growing with us. In addition to the Chestnut Ridge League, our swimmers also compete with the Allegheny Mountain Swimming League, which is a division of USA Swimming and provides a higher level of competition to our swimmers who wish to move forward. As the size of our team continues to grow, the knowledge, interest, and abilities of those that volunteer to keep these programs running also has grown. We currently have the interest and manpower to host AMS meets, which would add prestige and income not only to our team, but also to our school district. But our facility is not adequate enough to allow us to move forward. The proposed annex to the renovations would allow for the opportunity and possibility of that growth. This would have a domino effect by not only allowing our team to grow, but would also allow AMS to grow and prosper. The pool has not undergone any significant or notable renovations or additions since the original construction of the building, which has created many areas of concern. Those concerns are a combination of safety, space, aesthetics, and pure and simple embarrassment. A brief walk through the pool area will allow anyone to observe the overcrowded spectator area. The cracked tiles around the pool deck creating a safety hazard for swimmers walking in bare feet. A cramped pool deck that does not provide adequate space within to walk around. An outdated ventilation system that does not provide a safe breathing environment for swimmers, coaches, meet volunteers, or spectators. Inadequate seating areas around the pool deck for swimmers to utilize during competitions. Outdated and cramped locker room space that does not permit multiple teams to change with respect and dignity. In addition, spectators are forced to use restrooms inside the locker rooms alongside the swimmers, and that does not allow for a proper safe sport environment. I feel it is important to point out that the facility is utilized not only by our club, but also the Penn Trafford Area Recreation Commission, the Penn Trafford Adult Education Program, and the Penn Trafford High School Swimming and Diving Team. These organizations are all intertwined and provide feeder programs to one another. The pool is the only pool within our community where residents obtain swim lessons for their little ones, can join a competitive swim team with their school-aged children, or where a high school student can have the chance to join a high school swim team, or anyone can find simple recreation in a pool environment. This March will mark the end of my tenure as president of PTAC, and I could not walk away in good conscience without publicly speaking out on behalf of everyone in the community that utilizes the high school pool facility. 
I understand and appreciate that the high school annex and renovations to the pool are a top priority if money is left over from the base plan. However, the annex project is so crucial that you have to find a way to fund it regardless of where the construction bids come in. Our program's future is at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, as you know, my family was involved and I was, I was at a swimming a couple weeks ago and had trouble actually getting back to the basketball game because of the pool that was so cramped. So. Hey, have you and Hank spoke about uh, the improvements to the pool? Yes, yes. We've talked a lot. What's being proposed? What's being proposed will be an improvement. Um, so I, I would love for a lot, a lot, a lot of things to happen, but I'm also trying to be realistic and and conscious of the financial situation of, of the district. What we need is a new pool. That's what we need. But I don't believe that that would happen. And and Hank has been very imaginative about trying to get as much space as we can and trying to get uh, the best situation given the confines of what's being presented, um, you know, I, I guess by the board or, or by the situation. Okay, thank you. Matt, I do have a question. Matt, when are we going to revisit the last bond discussion? I know there's a timing. We are uh, going to do that in March. Actually. So in March. Okay. And they're coming to speak at that time. If we extend that out to 20, what that allows us to do with uh, this last one's approximately 17. Correct, Brett? Correct. If we extend that out to 20, what additional money that. Uh, I'll have him address what, that's what 20 years would look like, yes. So that is an opportunity in addition to, and keep in mind, and I think, uh, Nick, you pointed this out multiple times, that bonds in the past were typically 20 years in order to receive any kind of... Pancon always wanted 20 years. We didn't, <coughs> the reason Pancon said 20 years is that they only wanted you to do a project every 20 years. Sure. You sure. can high school in 10 years now, they expect Pancon to be 30% right. again. So 20 years was their minimum amount of years before they would approve another construction for that building okay. that was their pool so we're hoping to in March then uh, discuss uh, what the opportunity is for that as well as uh, one of the actual uh, documents from a bid perspective when do we the expect bids is April so that's April? why we want to have all of our discussions ahead of time so when they come open in April we'll be ready to go okay. right the April May question how many lanes are <coughs> we have six, and uh, that's pretty standard. Uh, the newer pools that are being built have eight. Eight. Eight is your Olympic size, is that correct? Uh, Olympic size is a designation as to the length, which is 50 meters. Oh, okay. I'm um, eight, eight lanes, too. It's not eight lanes. Uh, an Olympic pool is eight lanes okay. and 50 meters long. Ours is 25 yards and six lanes. No, you missed the second time you mentioned a new pool. Give me a price tag on a new pool, publicly. I, I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. tell you, but it would be yeah, millions. Ten million. Ten million. Ten million. Thank you. I've seen a couple of them. They are beautiful, but that's a beautiful price. Fox Chapel's building them right now. Is that right? It's, they're, that's they're why he knows it off the top of his head like that. We're doing one at Fox Chapel. That's, that's a big place. And I, I'll tell you, I've been to Fox Chapel's pool. I, I think it's nicer than what we have now. The original pool. Is that the right, Dave? Am I right on that? Yes. You could go to any pool and it would be nicer than the pool right now. <laughs> <laughs> Bethel Park just built a beautiful eight-lane pool. Connellsville's pool, they just built, rebuilt their pool. It's beautiful. Bethel Park's still a figure, I believe, with 84 million. Am I correct on that? Yeah, I would, I would yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The entire project. Mm -hmm. I think it actually ended up even higher than that. I thought it was 90. What was it, 90 yet? <coughs> couple parts. 75. That was higher than that. We did that project. <laughs> 75 with change order. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you, Chris. Um, next, Rand Danelli. Hello. Good evening. My name is Brandon Malley. I'm a 55 year resident of Warrior Court, and I know you're thanking the North Battle for the street. Um, I want to make a few comments about the uh, access roads. Um, 
First, just a brief comment to back to brief here. Uh, I think we would all agree, and Dr. Harris's letter said as much in his letter to the residents that uh, I probably should have communicated a little better to us. The fact that it was not on the table, and all of a sudden, it seems like it's a done deal. With that aside, um, personally, I understand the you know, need for an ancestor. I agree with you know, the reasoning. Dr. Trey's examples, obviously, those things you need to have plans. I think we need a little more specific definition as to what an emergency is, so there's no you know, gray area, so to speak. Um, I appreciate those who have spoken, uh, stating that they support keeping it on the access road. Uh, I think the concerns of my neighbors and myself is what happens down the road. As I said, who's uh, to say and remember what I said tonight, five years from now. Uh, so I just want to leave you, hopefully the rest of the board agrees with those who have already spoken and support it. I hope it's not to anything other than emergency, but um, I'm going to leave with three words. Hopefully this, those three words will be uh, what you can remember. Safety, functionality, and effectiveness. Safety. Uh, Warrior Court is a narrow road. There's no sidewalks. People walk up and down the street. They walk their kids. They walk their dogs. People backing out of the driveways. Um, there's a 20 mile an hour speed limit posted. Uh, people have to bet that that will not be adhered to. Um, particularly if you have 17 and 18 year old kids late in class, whatever. We have buses to the mix. I think it's just an accident waiting to happen. Uh, functionality, uh, as I said, the road is narrow. There's no shoulder. Uh, the road is a very poor condition. Uh, there's cracks, there's bumps. Uh, there's also a drainage issue for the back end of the warrior port. Where there's water, and there should be water. It's uh, icing over. Uh, kind of surprised me when I heard that it was on the table to have an access road open for public daily use because it's kind of hard to get two cars through without taking the time. I can't really imagine what it would be like having buses on the so that kind of surprised me. And the third is effectiveness. And as Mr. Leonard said, you have two ex exits pretty much two or three hundred yards away. Um, I don't see how particularly in the bank leaving, where that would help things flow and things smoother. If you have people coming out of Warrior Court, normally the traffic backs up past Warrior Court, so you need somebody blocking traffic at Warrior Court that's blocking the traffic that's coming out of high school. So it's, unless you have some kind of you know, plan where they're going back one way and right the other way, uh, it's not going to work. So again, I'll be brief. Um, safety, functionality, and fact that so clear. All of the board tonight will realize that and hopefully keep it only for emergencies. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Dunnell. Um, BJ Couch? I think I got it. Hi, my name is BJ Couch. I live on Warrior Court. I've lived there about 15 years. And my concern this evening, again, I want to reiterate that I think safety is a huge issue, but I would just like to comment, if we really are thinking about safety as a major issue, why are we trying to address it in the model project with the change that's left over at the end? Why don't we make this into a bigger issue and see about um, putting funding or addressing this on a grander scale with one of the other options? Um, to tell you the truth, if there was something like that, I wouldn't care if they drove through my yards. I mean, drove through our yards if they had to. But you could not fit a fire truck through an access road on a border court. It would not work. So my concern is, I think I don't know this respect to the engineers, and I'm certainly not an engineer, so I don't know that. But it appears that we're only addressing a small portion of just the gravel road right now. But I think we need to look a little further beyond that. Once you get past the gravel road, where are you going? how much of the emergency exit is it really going to be? I don't think you'd be able to get out of it if you had a fire truck or something that had to come through it. Um, so 
So I would just like to request that more, you know, this be taken off the table for now and look at it as a bigger safety issue that should be addressed on a grander scale and that possibly using the funds um, towards purchasing different property that would make it come out on the 993, which would solve more than one of your issues, but would solve your emergency response issue, but would also um, play a major part on your uh, traffic issue. Because if you did, that's another concern. If you did have an emergency and you brought people through that gravel road, I mean, you're so close to the first entrance as it is, and maybe for them out, I don't know how they're going to get them on any faster than that. Or to get anybody in the parking the way it is. Thank you, Ms. Calhoun. Anybody, any comments before we go on the next one? Okay, um, Susan Donnelly. My name is Susan Donnelly. I live uh, on Warrior Court. I've lived there for 27 years. I am the wife of Grant Donnelly. Um, he's brought it up major, major points um, that I certainly agree with. Um, I also agree with BJ's comments. Um, I feel that this would be a band-aid on a much larger issue if it comes to safety. I don't feel that the access road would lead out far enough for an actual emergency if it would be required. Um, I do think that you should explore other venues besides this. I certainly understand you doing this as a, as a band aid to the project of safety at this point, but I don't think it really holds true to the entire issue of the safety of this school district in a, an actual emergency, a terrorist attack of some sort. I mean, we've seen this across the country, and we as the proximity on Warrior Court are just too close. If you can get the kids out onto 993 faster than just coming out Warrior Court and being a quarter mile off the road. Um, so that's my comment on the issue. Thank you, Susan. Um, any comment? Um, I, I, I have one. Uh, the, the two of you gave some very good ideas. I mean, we were hoping that she thought it was going to be good to see because there is a gamut of other safety rather than your perception of the band-aid, which is, you know, they may know the truth to that. It's one component, but we understand there are more pieces to this process that we're all kind of curious about, too, because there could be an awful lot more done, and we have a very active safety program. So I'm, I'm, I feel certain we'll probably pursue that. We certainly were hoping we'd have more added information, as you're suggesting, too. Thank you. Yes, because that's what I've heard before. Um, I think they did do a traffic investigation on 130 several years ago, and I think it was well over the limit as to where it was, you know, where it should be for the size of the road and the traffic that comes on it as it is already. So to think about making, you know, a fix of an access road, especially for emergency vehicles, onto a road that is already over that for safety issues, um, really hurt. Um, Hank, Dan, do you have any <coughs> comments? Because, you know, I think they raised some valid points there. Um, you got a gravel road, how really you want to get? Well, I, I wasn't privy to the, uh, to the meetings with the, with the safety committee, but my understanding was it's not an emergency access road to evacuate the school district student body in, in 40 buses in the case of an emergency because I'm not sure there's 40 buses waiting on campus to put the kids into to drive out. I thought it was more of an emergency access road. If, if you have a drill and you're trying to get the students away from the building, there's another way for them to walk away from the building. Things, things like that. If you're, trying to get, if you're trying to get emergency vehicles onto campus, police onto campus, and the, and the main access road is blocked, there's another way for police vehicles to get onto campus to to address the, the concerns. I, I don't believe it was it was meant, and again, I wasn't part of that meeting, but I don't believe it was meant to be an emergency evacuation road to evacuate the, the student body of the high school, because you, you wouldn't have the buses here to do that anyway. This is something for our next safety meeting. We can have um, Chief Otto meet, meet with the building committee, and we can also review our auditor Doug 
Brown, a War Report resident. Thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. I appreciate a lot of uh, the comments that are done here, um, and you know the, how everybody is uh, you know, taking the issue up now. I also was kind of shocked that it got back on the agenda so quick, and, and how we were notified of it. We were found out about it through the paper. Uh, we do appreciate the letter that was sent out uh, from the superintendent. Um, I just wanted to say that if, like, right now, if I couldn't get out this front entrance, I put my truck in four-wheel drive, I drive right across the top of the baseball field. There's an inordinate space between two houses on Warrior Court. I come right out of Warrior Court. You probably wouldn't be happy with me doing that, but, you know, in an emergency situation, if I felt my life was threatened, that's what I would do. Uh, but, you know, if that front entrance was blocked, you can also access the high school from from that place. I don't know if they're, you know, the, the residents of those two homes could be approached. If you look at it like during normal weather, I mean, you know, spring-like weather or whatever you can see, it's almost like an access, it almost looks like there was a planned access there anyway. It's kind of like a gravel. I mean, the residents use it for a driveway right now, but it kind of goes right onto the property. Um, just an idea that, that came to me. I was contemplating the um, situation. So, um, it's nice to see all uh, my neighbors here tonight. And uh, that you all are taking this up in a, in a matter of consideration. That, uh, you, know, you know, please put yourself in our place as you go to vote for this. If, it was, if you lived on Warrior Court, how would you feel? And if you say, wow, you know, these people have a uh, point, I really wouldn't want that to happen to me, then. Please vote no for that, that or, or find another better um, option. Thank you. Right, thank you, um, Mr. Brown. Uh, last, um, John Rossi. Yes, my name is John Rossi. Uh, I live in one of the water departments in here for about 12 years. And I'm not going to repeat everything that my neighbors have already expressed to everyone here, but because I agree with everything that you said, uh, the idea of putting another access point three or four hundred yards apart on to every one thirty really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, if we need an emergency exit, it needs to be on, on a road uh, less traffic, 993, I believe would be a better option. And I understand you would have to buy some property to, to get an access road to that route. Um, and I, I agree with the, the space there, but we're using that for an emergency exit. We have no interest in using that road as a, a bus route. You had asked that, that the other, how the other folks felt that didn't speak. I'm speaking for myself, and I can tell you that there's not an interest in this board to use that as a road. It is used for daily traffic or anything other than emergency scenarios. And I agree with Phil, and I think everybody here feels very strongly that they're not against putting a policy in place so that future boards have to vote as a, a, a group to have consensus to change it for anything other than what, it, what it, this board 
for the safety committee feels it should be used for. Uh, I just wanted to clear that up for you. Just because I didn't speak doesn't mean I don't agree, but uh, I, I didn't want to continue to reiterate the same thing. But I felt, uh, since you had a few people saying that, I wanted to make sure you knew that I feel very strongly as well uh, that it should not be used for anything other than an emergency scenario. Thank you. I personally would like to hear what Officer Otto, Chief Otto, excuse me, um, has to say about it. You all raised some very good concerns. I, mean, I haven't been on lawyers for the years. And we've in combination with our whole safety to be allowed to the whole committee. Oh, well, I understand. But <laughs> no, 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 no. And I understand that. I want to. And actually, the original person came actually from our safety audit. I kind of want to know where the safety audit where it comes from. Our safety committee. Our safety <coughs> responding to our safety audit. Chief Otto is on our safety committee because he made his presence in that Yeah, I guess I would be, I would want to know exactly what the safety committee, um, in conjunction with the local police, what they're intended, how they would intend to use it in the, in the midst of a true crisis. Uh, and how they can realistically use it. And, and like you all, I would want to know what you find a true crisis. Um, so I think we need, my, my opinion is we need a little more information. Uh, President, um, basically uh, what you stated is, is an important point. It's not a, an emergency road, it's a pretty broad subject. A crisis response access road, that's what we're talking about here. It would only be needed, used as a safety belt, not necessarily only if they had to get children out or people out or whatever, to get emergency folks in. I, I toss it over with the, uh, Chief of Police prior, they wouldn't be coming in there and foot walking. You know. They're talking about lickety split lane vehicles in quick. He get as many people on site responding to the situation as quickly as possible. That's the that's a crisis response. It's not necessarily an emergency. Emergency could be too much snow. Emergency can be somebody broke their car down in the middle of the road. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about if it's <coughs> a crisis response policy and security, secure. No, I just stated we have to develop that. There is no there is no specific criteria for for a crisis response road. We would develop a policy, go in the policy manual unless the board feels differently. I'm one of nine. Though it would be specific as to what that would be. No, I'm I think sorry. Means, I was not talking about the purpose or use of it. I was talking about the design and the functionality of it. Meaning, you know, can you designate a gravel road of 25 feet as a legitimate crisis response access point? And I, once you come through that point, where it brings you out to, is that enough? Because if you're really saying that that's your concern about getting people in there, where do you put that in and they won't fit? Or it's too much weight over the gravel road? If I can add to that, this is from the tactical component of it, having had some experience this area. Basically, <coughs> it was nice to see that so many were so open and I mean, so comforting and so many would often offer your area to allow kids to come through and bail out and whatever. That's really comforting for all of us. But in actuality, it's a tactical plan. And they'll look, when you were talking about an access point, look like a natural way by which you could drive vehicles through. A person, this response team would look at helicopter assets, whatever they have in SWAT teams and so on, and they'll look at approaches that are most convenient to as plans A, B, and C to approach the building. That means cutting through your yard, your yard, your yard down the line. They'll devise that into a main tactical plan with a number of options depending on location of the perpetrator and that type of thing. So this could expand to quite a wide, uh, wide opportunity. Again, thank you for being so kind to allow uh, you to be part of the battleground. God forbid we ever have to deal with that, but uh, it may be a, an ultimately excellent plan coming from 993, coming from wherever it might be. So if that helps. Okay. Any further comment? Okay. Thank you. Any further comment? All right, then we will continue with the rest of our meeting. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the Treasurer's report and the high school extracurricular fund report? So moved. Motion by Tracy. Second. Second. Second by Dell. Question. Question being called for. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 
All opposed, no. Motion carried. May I have a motion to approve the list of bills for the month of February? Second. Motion by Mr. Petrucci. Second. Second by Scott. Dr. Costa, motion. Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. Um, I don't think there's any old business. Is None. There? None? Okay, uh, we don't have a need at this time for an executive session, so we will move right into new business. Dr. Koshko, athletics and extracurricular. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, move to accept the following resignation. Stephanie Brugman, assistant track coach, effective immediately. Second. Second by Mr. Petrucci. Question. <coughs> Question being called for. All in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. Move to employ the following personnel. New employment is contingent upon the receipt of all necessary documentation, the acceptance of Act 34, 151, and 114 waivers from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania within 30 days. Eric Rieger, full-time assistant track coach. Amanda Shannon, full-time assistant track coach. Second. Second by Mr. Petrucci. Question. Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carried. <coughs> Move to approve the following volunteer coaches. All coaches volunteers must have Act 34, 151, and Act 114 waivers on file with the athletic director. Kim Graziano, volunteer swim coach. Stephanie Martini, volunteer assistant, 7th and 8th grade girls volleyball coach. And Joe Novak, volunteer varsity baseball coach. Second. Question. <coughs> Second by Mr. Leonard. I'm sorry. Okay, I think we had a question. Okay. Question. Um, question being called for. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carried. That'll be all, Madam President. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Koshko. Budget and Finance, Mr. Kotasik. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I move to authorize the administration to make payments amounting to $10,664. Credits earned by professional employees in accordance with the negotiated agreement. The list as presented to the board. Showing the individual payments due will be filed with the official minutes of this meeting. Second. Second by Mr. Petrucci. Question. Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. Move to approve the following expenditures for the high school renovation project according to the schedule as listed. Second. Second by Mr. Petrucci. Question. <laughs> Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. That's all, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Kachastic. Building and grounds and safety. Mr. Leonard. Yes, Madam President. I have one motion I'd like to put on the board for consideration. I'd like to make a motion to accept the following retirement resignation effective March 13, 2014. Richard Dranuski, custodian at Penn Middle. Second. Question. Um, question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carries. That is all I have, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Uh, Mr. Nemig, employee relations, negotiations, and transportation. Nothing tonight, Madam President. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Nemec. Dr. Trey, food service. Nothing to report, Madam President. Thank you, Dr. Trey. Mr. Petrucci, personnel and curriculum. Thank you, Madam President. My good young friend here, Mr. Kachansky, says we should put the report <coughs> first. So, number nine will be read first. Move to point Dr. Matthew F. Harris, the superintendent of Penn Chamber School District, effective February 10, 2014, to June 30, 2017, at a salary of $129,000. Second. Second by Mr. Leonard. Question. Yes. Question being called for. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. Welcome. Yes. Want to make a statement? <laughs> well, the meeting was kind of long, but <laughs> I'll make it a little bit longer. Um, one, first of all, thanks for everyone in the audience who came out tonight. Thanks for all the administrators, school board. Very, very good honor. 
Um, the next three and a half years of working at Penn Traffic will be very exciting as it offers many great opportunities. The non-negotiable goals created by the board have kept our staff very busy and motivated to take students to a higher level of learning and understanding. I will work closely with the board to develop new goals to continue strengthening our district to ensure that we remain a top school in the state. The building project at the high school will enable us to implement many academic enhancements, showcase our extracurricular activities, and provide students with more opportunities for college credit, career preparation, and 21st century skills. Our middle school will be offering new opportunities as well. Jim and Roger have many ideas for implementing new programs for students to address foreign languages, STEAM, and other academic readiness. Our elementary schools will be planning and implementing a new science series, computer instruction, writing program, and new opportunities for mass customized learning. The board will be working hard during the first next few months to identify a food vendor, update the technology program with a potential million dollar technology purchase, prepare a new budget, and start the preparations to determine the building needs for the rest of the district. I like being active, so I'm up for the challenge. I'm glad to have Mr. Inglis' support, knowledge, and commitment, as he has done an amazing job doing double duty. Mr. Lego is a financial genius whose analytical brain power keeps PTSD and traffic running efficiently, and he knows how to say no to my spending, so it's always good. <laughs> Mr. Carazia knows all the special education laws in and out, and he will make sure that all children in our district receive a top-notch education. All of the Act 93 administrators work very hard in their area to make each day better for the life of a child. The teachers' devotion to our children never go unnoticed as they work hard day and night and on their time off to raise student achievement, and it is reflected in our state test scores. All of the support staff, both in-house and out, go out of their way to meet the many demanding needs of a wide variety of people, <coughs> and somehow they just make it work and they make it look easy. And that's not hard to do. It's not easy to do. <laughs> I feel hard, I feel very blessed to be working in a school district in which I'm part of the community. Penn Trafford is a great place to raise a family. The people are friendly and the community is safe. The township officials and all of our emergency management leaders and their staff are actively involved in schools and the communities they serve. Parents have expectations for their children and they embrace the opportunities that the school district has to offer. Residents who no longer have school age children are still proud of their community and they are very supportive of their schools that they, and this, that service their children. And finally, I'm very honored and humbled to be here, and I look forward to working with the dedicated staff, parents, and students at Penn Travers Coaching. Move to approve additional substitute teacher support personnel for the month of February 2014. Second. Second by Dr. Trey. Question. Question being called for. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. <coughs> motion carried. Move to, fix, move to issue a question contract to the following teacher in course with section 1108 of the School Law of Pennsylvania. The teacher has satisfied to complete three years of teaching in the Penn Trapper School District. Robert Devon, Social Studies teacher at Penn Trapper High School. Second. Second by Mr. Leonard. Question. Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. Move to just a quick moment. It seems like just yesterday, it's kind of funny that three years ago by I know. that we were hiring Bobby Devon. He Bobby has done an excellent job maintaining work. I'm up here a lot of nights. Um, my kids have different events, and I kind of like to walk the hallways. And he's always over in his classroom working. And it's kind of nice to see. And sometimes I want to go in and say, you know, go home, go go do something else. And it, it's he's a real nice guy, and it's kind of funny to believe that three years has passed. Just for point information, for anybody who follows sports, um, um, Bobby's dad, Bob Divins, and a good friend of mine. Uh, passed away, I think, in 1998, 1999. Uh, I was also uh, Bob's coach in the 93 team of traffic. And uh, just as you know, Bob's father had the privilege, he got a full scholarship from North Carolina State. But Lou Holtz was his coach. And anybody who knows name Lou Holtz, he coached Notre Dame to a national championship. And, uh, and Lou Holtz still keeps uh, in touch because. Uh, uh, Michael played both, graduated both, Michael and Bobby, Bobby Dan both graduated here. But uh, Bobby's father passed away the world. He was uh, very, very, 
very sympathetic to the South. Because remember, Bobby and Bobby played for the North Carolina State. Bobby did play in three ball games. So it's one of our athletes that did come through the school district that uh, did go to Division I and did perform in the ball games. So it's uh, very touching, very sad death. Very quick. <coughs> Okay, sorry to throw it out, but his dad was always just a real guy. Move to approve the following leave requests and subs as listed. Second. Second, Second Mr. Katak. Question. Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carried. Move to approve the following clinical practice request from Duke University and Chatham University as listed. Second. Second by Mr. Leonard. Question, question. Question being called for. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carries. Move to accept the following res resignation. Lauren Barr, fair professional from Middle School, effective February 4th, 2014. Second. Second by Mr. Leonard. Question. Question being called for. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Okay, we can put the phone first on the new employment and contingent upon the receipt of all necessary documentation and extends back 34, 151, 114 waivers from Crown of Pennsylvania within 30 days. Shannon Marzaleski, paraprofessional, Penn Mill School, beginning February 11, 2014, at $10.05 per hour. Second. Second by Dr. Trey. Question. Question. Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. Move to approve the following makeup day as designated by, on the 2013-14 school year. School closed on January 28, 2014. Makeup day will be Thursday, April 17, 2014. Second. Second by Mr. Question. Lund. Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. Do you think, Nick, if you put a proposal out here that says there's no more snow days, that that would be the end of it? I'll tell you, I don't know. <laughs> they said uh, they get another, I was watching the channel, and um, they got an idea. So, anyway, he says we have now had 17 days, and that's not kind of tonight. 17 days, it's been below 10 degrees. And this, and this month, and we have this week here, yes, not that. But next week is the fall is supposed to come. So it's a global warming. That's global warming. I won't global warming. That, that. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, that was unbelievable. This is, anybody thought of old time winter? This is definitely an old time winter. It's uh, cold as unbelievable. Good old fashioned. <laughs> Moved to approve the Penn Traverse High School band trip to Hollywood, California from November 28th to December 4th, 2014 with a written request from Mr. David Cornelius, band director. The band will participate in the Hollywood Christmas Parade Parades and in Disneyland and Universal Studios Hollywood, as well as the band and color guard workshop with Disney professionals. There will be no cost to school. Second. Second by Mr. Cass. Question. Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. So I have my present. Thank you, Mr. Petrucci. Um, who wants to take Mr. Miller? Dr. Trey. Dr. Trey. Uh, we move to accept and, and file the minutes of the superintendent's information committee meeting held on Monday, January 6th, 2014. Second. Second by Mr. Leonard. Question being called for. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. Move to approve the following revised policies and administrative regulations as presented to the board. <coughs> These policies and regu regulations we made an official part of the minutes as listed. Second. Question. Second. Mr. Patrice. Question. Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. I move to tentatively approve the following policies and administrative regulations as presented to the school board as listed. Second. Second by Mr. Patrice. Question. Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. I move carried. to approve the administrative regulations section 200, 300, 600, 700, 800, and 900, which accompany the policies that are already been approved by the board. Second. Second by Mr. Leonard. Question. <coughs> Question being called for. This will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. 
Motion carried. Move to appoint Mr. Martin Stovall to the Westmoreland County Tax Collection Committee. Second. Second by Dr. Question. Question, Question being called for, this will be a roll call vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carried. That's all I have, uh, Madam President. All right, thank you, Dr. Trey. Uh, Mr. Stovar, taxes, insurance, and census. Uh, nothing this evening, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Stovar. Um, Ms. Schoep, um, solicitor's report. Thank you, Madam President. There's three areas that I thought the board should be apprised of. The three sets of bills that the governor signed, one um, group of bills he signed on December 18th. There were 10 separate laws pertaining to the protection of minors from abuse an outgrowth of the Sandusky um, scandal at Penn State University. And it is, is very broad. One of them um, provides numerous amendments to the Professional Educator Discipline Act, broadening the reasons why discipline can be imposed by the Department of Education on educators. <coughs> One um, requires um, the school, if um, a joint investigation of child abuse between local law enforcement and child and youth agencies, um, exists if an investigation is concerning a school employee. Upon notification, the school shall immediately implement a plan of supervision or alternative arrangement for the individual under investigation to ensure the safety of the child and other children who are in the care of the school. The um, one bill also um, broadened the definition of bodily injury under the Child Protective Services Law for Child Abuse. Previously, it was defined as a serious bodily injury. It has now been expanded to include the language of bodily injury, which um, broadens the ability of the Child Protective Services to reach out and help children in the community. So there's, there are a lot of different things that happen, but many of them are in regard to the school, and it is a result of many task force working together at the state level in order to provide greater protections for children. The other one is um, a small games of chance law that was passed and it will become effective January 27th. And the requirements under the small games of chance are rather interesting. The State Police Liquor Control Enforcement Bureau is responsible to enforce and educate. Lieutenant James Jones, who's located in Allegheny County, it's his responsibility to statewide make sure that the laws are being enforced, but he focuses mostly on education. And what we've learned by looking at the new law and comparing it to the old law is that local entities who have auctions, sometimes they're called Chinese auctions, or all different kinds of ways, they sell tickets and collect money, um, no one was following the old law. So that's, that, that's kind of an interesting thing. So we're having, um, Lieutenant Jones is doing a seminar for all the school districts in Allegheny County in February. And we're thinking maybe in March there might be an interest in Westmoreland County to have him come out and, and um, do that. And the, so that the new requirements under the new law are followed, but more importantly, that the requirements under the old law are followed. Um, so that's that piece, and that becomes effective January 27th. And I think of even greater interest, um, the governor signed Senate Bill number 57 last week, and that bill permits the school districts to intercept oral communications for disciplinary or security purposes on a school bus or a school vehicle. But in order to do that, a school board has to adopt a policy that authorizes the audio interception for disciplinary or security purposes. And then each school year, the school board has to not notify students and their parents or guardians of the policy by a letter mailed to the student's home addresses. And thirdly, the school board has to post a notice that students may be audio taped, and that notice has to be clearly visible on each school bus or school vehicle that is furnished with audio recording equipment. It applies only to a school bus or a school vehicle used for the purpose um, of the school, but if it's not school related and you're using your buses, you can't audio tape. So that might be something the board considers. That is something I should um, look more into. I think I'd like to have that information as well as the small games, especially because those are two things. We, we attend a lot of fundraisers, and I know there's a lot of Chinese auctions. Um, I buy a lot of tickets. Myself. Yeah, we all do. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. PTEA, PTEA representative, Mr. Reinier. I'd uh, just like to congratulate Dr. Harris. Congratulate the board. I think you picked a good guy. 
and I think the staff will be uh, more than pleased. All right. Um, do I have a motion for adjournment? Motion. All right. The meeting will be adjourned at eight forty-one. <laughs>